This is Radio EcoShock with Alex Smith. You can't see them, but you are surrounded by billions of tiny particles. When bits of dust or droplets hang in the air, scientists call them aerosols. In the atmosphere, aerosols protect us a little bit from being too hot. As smog, they kill us by the millions every year. What happens to aerosols? As the world heats up even more, we need to know. Our guest, Dr. Robert Allen, wades into what may be one of the most complex questions of science. After getting his Ph.D. in atmosphere, ocean, and climate dynamics at Yale, Robert was a postdoctoral scholar at various places, including at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We have called Dr. Allen about his new paper, Enhanced Land-Sea Warming Contrast Elevates Aerosol Pollution in a Warmer World. From the University of California, Dr. Allen, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Oh, thank you for having me. So, Bob, when you're out in public, how do you explain what an aerosol is? Uh, I describe it as a, uh, basically a suspension of fine particles in the atmosphere. They could be liquid or solid, um, but from a climate standpoint, we're more interested in the solid particles because they have an impact on Earth's uh, energy balance which has important implications for the climate system of the planet. And they also have an impact on human health. When we talk about aerosols, we usually break them down into two different categories. We have uh, anthropogenic aerosol, man-made aerosol. And these are things like uh, your your sulfates, your nitrates, your organic aerosol. And then we also have natural aerosols, which are kind of emitted, for the most part, independent of humans. And uh, natural aerosols constitute basically dust and, and sea salt. When sunlight arrives on Earth, some of it bounces and radiates back out into space, but some of the sun's energy is held within the Earth's atmosphere by greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. And a significant portion of the sun's light never reaches the surface because it strikes aerosols first. What happens up there? Yeah, so these aerosol particles, uh, like I mentioned before, impact Earth's energy balance. And aerosols generally absorb or reflect sunlight. So depending on the aerosol species, so for example, sulfate aerosol is, is a basically 100% scattering aerosol, whereas maybe like a black carbon aerosol is one of the anthropogenic aerosol species that actually absorbs sunlight. So the mixture of these various anthropogenic aerosols ultimately results in less sunlight reaching the surface of our planet, and that has a net uh, cooling effect. So overall, we think uh, these anthropogenic aerosols have had an overall cooling impact on the planet, and they've essentially offset some of the warming that we would have expected from the increase in greenhouse gases. They've kind of hidden our real situation. Yes, this is true. It turns out that we've uh, been running a bit of a geoengineering experiment, even though we haven't really uh, acknowledged it, in that uh, we've been emitting greenhouse gases, which cause uh, warming of the planet, and is the major focus of, of climate change, uh, but then we've also been emitting these uh, anthropogenic aerosol particles, which has a bit of a, it, it kind of counters some of the warming that we would have gotten for the, from the increase in greenhouse gases. So obviously aerosols are a bit complicated because on one hand, they offset some of the warming that we would have received, but on the other hand, aerosols um, have a negative impact on human health. We want to clean up the atmosphere from aerosols and air pollution to mitigate premature death. But if we do that, that's going to basically uh, exacerbate greenhouse gas-induced global warming. So maybe this is a foolish question, but why don't the greenhouse gases capture the energy reflected by aerosols in the lower atmosphere? So greenhouse gases uh, and aerosols interact with different parts of of electromagnetic radiation. So greenhouse gases primarily absorb longer-wave radiation that our planet is basically re-emitting back to space. Aerosol particles, on the other hand, do not really interact with this long-wave terrestrial radiation. They primarily interact with the solar radiation that is coming into our climate system. So greenhouse gases basically don't interact with short-wave solar energy like the aerosols do. Well, we have a, a general number for the number of parts per million of carbon dioxide, and lately the latest reading I saw was 414 parts per million, which is very concerning. Do we have a general number for the amount of global dimming caused by aerosols preventing that light from reaching the ground or the sea? Yeah, yeah, we do, we do. Basically, the emission of anthropogenic aerosols peaked in the 1970s and 1980s, 
And uh, over this, you know, 1970-1980 time frame, I think some estimates of the amount of global dimming are on the order of, uh, you know, three or four watts per meter squared for the Northern Hemisphere. And that, in turn, has been implicated in reducing Northern Hemisphere precipitation over this time frame. And it's possibly also associated with the devastating drought that the Sahel experienced in the 1970s and 1980s. Since the 70s and 80s, the United States and Europe in particular have implemented some air pollution policies uh, that has, have resulted in a, in a decrease in anthropogenic aerosol emissions. However, this has kind of been outweighed to some extent from a global perspective by continued increases, or enhanced increases, I should say, in parts of Asia, China and, and India in particular. All right. We're ready to talk about the new paper, Enhanced Land-Sea Warming Contrast Elevates Aerosol Pollution in a Warmer World, where you are the lead author, and it was published February 4th, 2019, in the prestigious journal Nature Climate Change. Now, there's a stunning statement in the introduction which says, quote, aerosols cause a net cooling effect which probably has offset about 40% of greenhouse gas warming. Unquote. And, and that's half the real warming potential getting shielded by pollution, if I'm reading it right, both man-made and natural. Does that mean we've created warming that is really 40% worse than we're experiencing so far? Or does it imply a change in time, putting off the arrival of the heat? I, I don't really understand what that figure means. That figure of 40% is referring to the fact that we've offset approximately 40% of the warming that we should have felt due to the increase in greenhouse gases simply due to the fact that we've been co-emitting anthropogenic aerosols, which have resulted in a net cooling effect due to their enhanced reflection of incoming sunlight. You know, the implication of this is that, again, if we were to try to clean up the atmosphere and improve air quality, that implies a reduction in these anthropogenic aerosol emissions, which implies a reduction in this cooling effect that we've implemented over the 20th century. And that in turn suggests that greenhouse gas-induced climate change and global warming will, will accelerate. I mean, there's been a couple of recent studies that have come out where they've basically, you know, in a climate model, you can kind of run some idealized simulations and, and they ask the question, well, if we remove all anthropogenic aerosol species from this climate model, how much does the uh, planet warm? They, you know, they looked at a couple different models because there's some, obviously there's some uncertainty in the aerosol effects on the climate system, and they found something like 0.5 to 1 degree C of warming if we completely remove all anthropogenic aerosol species. So that's a massive number. <laughs> you know, right now the planet's warmed about 1 degree C over the you know, 20th century due to the increase in greenhouse gases. So this offsetting effect that aerosols have is, is, is very significant. It sure is. And I know you published about my next question back in 2010 with Australia's Stephen Sherwood. What is the share of total aerosol shielding coming from natural sources and how much from human activity? I guess if you were to compare the amount of anthropogenic aerosol in the atmosphere versus the amount of natural aerosol, the amount of natural aerosol is much, much larger than the amount of anthropogenic aerosol by probably several times uh, larger. But the important thing here from a climate change standpoint is the change in these aerosol species over time. Over the 20th century, the increase in anthropogenic aerosol emissions has been very large. And the change in natural aerosol emissions has generally assumed to be essentially very small. So it's the change that we're most concerned with when we're referring to the climate change impacts of aerosol. And can scientists further break down how much of these aerosols come from, say, burning fossil fuels like cars, trucks, planes, and ships, and how much from other human activities like farming or agrochemicals, land use changes? That depends on the anthropogenic aerosol species that you're concerned with. Uh, something like, like a sulfate aerosol, for example, which forms in the atmosphere through the oxidation of sulfur dioxide. Most SO2 um, is emitted by fossil fuel power plants that primarily use, use coal as their main fossil fuel energy source. When you're talking about something like a, like a black carbon aerosol, well, it's about 40% uh, biomass burning, so things like uh, savanna clearing and, and, and deforestation. And the remaining 60% is, is due to fossil fuels, um, primarily things like diesel engines, for example. But there's also biofuel. Biofuel uh, is another large component of black carbon emissions. A lot of people living in, in developing countries still use wood as their primary source to heat their home or, or cook their food. And that results in a large emissions of, of these black carbon aerosols. 
Oh, boy. I'm heating with wood, so I'm contributing, too. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, they use a figure of 0.9 watts per meter squared for radiative forcing from aerosols. And the uncertainty range, though, is huge. The IPC suggests the radiative forcing could be twice as much or one-ninth as much as their 0.9 figure. So have scientists narrowed that range since, and does that uncertainty greatly affect the results of your paper? Yeah, this is one of the frustrating aspects. If you're in the, in the game of, of climate science and trying to understand the effects of aerosols on the climate system, is that aerosols, as well as clouds, are the main uncertainties for understanding the climate system and human perturbations to the climate system. The uncertainty range hasn't really decreased very much, so that's, that's a bit sobering. A lot of it has to do with the very complicated interactions that these submicron-sized particles have on the climate system. And I think another component of this is that there are multiple interactions and, and feedbacks within the climate system that make it very difficult to understand how you know, a submicron particle can have an impact on this much larger system. In the context of my study, the uncertainty in the radiative forcing of aerosols is not particularly important because we weren't focused on trying to understand the radiative effects of these aerosols. We were just focused on trying to understand how climate change impacts the amount of aerosol in the atmosphere. And what did you find? Well, we found that if you assume kind of a business-as-usual scenario where we continue combusting greenhouse gases at the current rate, you keep anthropogenic aerosol emissions fixed at, say, a present-day value. By the end of the century, the the burden of of anthropogenic aerosols will increase in response to this greenhouse gas-induced warming. That's kind of strange because we know that, for example, in China, people are trying to clean up the air, and yet you're saying that the conditions from climate change will actually lead towards an increase of aerosols. Is, Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So you can think of the amount of aerosol in the atmosphere, it's primarily a function of your emissions, but then it's also a function of other processes operating in the atmosphere, including transport and removal. So when you perturb the climate system, for example, you warm it through an increase in greenhouse gases, that, that impacts the atmospheric circulation, the winds, the precipitation patterns, the relative humidity, and those in turn have an impact on the transport of aerosols and their removal. And what we found is a relatively robust response, particularly in the northern hemisphere mid-latitudes, where these continents warm up at a faster rate than the corresponding ocean surface, and this promotes enhanced continental aridity, so basically enhanced drying of the continents. And this drying is linked to several climate parameters, including decreases in soil moisture, decreases in relative humidity, but we also found a decrease in what we call large-scale precipitation. And most of these aerosol species, the dominant removal mechanism is, in fact, precipitation. So if you reduce the amount of precipitation, you effectively reduce the amount of removal of these aerosol species. And that's ultimately what we argue is driving the increase in aerosol burden in response to future warming. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are listening to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is Dr. Robert Allen from the University of California, Riverside. We're talking about how new science projecting how pollution will behave in a hotter world. Your paper, Bob, in Nature Climate Change says the latest models show a greater shielding of Earth from the sun during the hottest times of the year in the Northern Hemisphere's summer. For those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, isn't that a good thing, helping to shade us from what would be the worst of the heat? That is a good thing in, in that, yes, these, these aerosols have a net negative impact on the energy balance of the planet, which would result in surface cooling. But this effect is going to be much, much, much smaller than the warming perturbation due to the increase in greenhouse gases. And maybe more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, these aerosols not only impact the climate system, but they have a negative impact on human health. As you know, we're experiencing more extreme precipitation events, whether it's dumps of snow, like we're getting where I am right now, or inches of rain. And this is happening all over the world. The IPCC released a special report saying extreme precipitation events will increase as the world heats up. 
Won't that extra rain wash out even more pollution, revealing the true heat from the emissions we've released? That's a good question, and that's a, that's a bit of a subtlety on the effects of precipitation on removal of these aerosol particles. It's generally thought that if you increase the intensity of rainfall, that's not necessarily going to result in enhanced removal of these aerosol species because it, the, the process becomes saturated at a certain level of rainfall intensity. That increasing the intensity of rainfall above this threshold doesn't result in a net increase in aerosol removal. And there have been a couple studies that have looked at this, and it's basically a distinction between the intensity of precipitation and the frequency of precipitation. And it may be the case that the frequency of precipitation is more important in dictating the removal of these aerosol species than the intensity. Could you tell us a bit more about the dominant driver that you found that you call the land-sea warming contrast What is that? Take whatever time you need to explain that for us, would you? Yeah, it's a very fundamental result in climate change. Uh, It's supported by model simulations, and it's supported by kind of fundamental theory. And basically, it just involves when you increase greenhouse gases, the land uh, warms more than than the corresponding oceans. That's what the land-sea warming contrast is. And it has a couple different ways it can be explained. In terms of the ocean, uh, the oceans have greater thermal inertia than do the continents. So, for example, they can transport some of the heat that they absorb to depth, thereby creating the surface less warm than it otherwise would be. But there are other processes involved that are probably more important, and it has to do with the fact that there are moisture limitations over land, whereas these same moisture limitations obviously don't exist over the ocean. So one of the fundamental quantities that we often use to try to better understand the land-sea warming contrast is the breakdown between sensible and latent heating. And over the ocean, like I said, you, have, you basically have an unlimited amount of moisture, so a lot of the incoming energy can go into evaporation. And that, by definition, is it's latent energy. It doesn't manifest itself in terms of a, of a change in temperature. But over the continents, where moisture is more limited, more of the incoming energy can go into sensible heating. So that's one explanation. And, and there are a few others involving differences in boundary layer, land-sea contrast, and lapse rates. And there are also considerations involving changes in relative humidity between the land and the ocean. Yeah, it's basically just the land warms up at a faster rate than does the ocean. A few weeks ago, we talked with the young scientist Yang Yang Shu at uh, Texas A&M. And he found, looking at the attempted cleanup of pollution in China, that local meteorological conditions would likely encourage even more smog despite that cleanup effort. For example, there'd be more stagnation days and the precipitation might increase, but there would be more dry days in between that. Does that basically agree with what your study found? Yeah, that's a similar argument as, as what we are proposing. I guess uh, stagnation has a component that's related to precipitation, as you mentioned, but it also has a component related to wind speeds. So if you have a decrease in, say, upper level or surface wind speeds, then that promotes the accumulation of aerosol particles in that region, which obviously leads to a reduction in air quality. Um, some of these aerosol particles form through reactions with, within the atmosphere, so as the, as the conditions for stagnation, if they were to increase, then there would be more time for these precursor particles to react with other aerosol species and sunlight to form these secondary organic aerosols. So it's generally, it's gen- generally um, arguing along the same lines as, as what we are. Robert Allen, let's break off for a minute to discuss something I learned from your previous paper in 2012. I should have known this, but I didn't know that the tropics are expanding north and south as the world warms. You say it's not directly caused by greenhouse gas emissions, but something else. What is causing the tropics to expand, and how do we know that? Yeah, this is a, this is a topic of, uh, of intense research, actually. The, the causes of tropical expansion are multiple. <laughs> there are multiple explanations, uh, and it also depends on, on the hemisphere, northern hemisphere versus southern hemisphere. Uh, I want to start off by saying that greenhouse gases do cause the tropics to widen, but there are other components. Um, I argue that these, uh, these absorbing aerosols, the black carbon aerosols that we previously discussed, are a driver of tropical widening in the northern hemisphere. And in the southern hemisphere, the depletion of stratospheric ozone has also been impl- implicated 
in the polar expansion of the tropical belt in the southern hemisphere. Well, this isn't a little thing. I mean, you cite a 2008 paper by Seidel et al., and you suggest the tropics expanded by somewhere between 2 to 5 degrees of latitude since 1979, not that long ago. And I used rough back-of-the-envelope calculations at the high end of 5 degrees latitude. That moves the tropics about 350 miles or 550 kilometers closer to most of my listeners. That must have huge implications for humans and, and the planet. Yeah, so the Seidel paper that you uh, refer to was kind of one of the one of the first manuscripts that discussed this idea that the tropics were widening. The number you quote, two to five degrees of latitude of widening, was a very preliminary um, calculation. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, subsequent follow-on studies that have tried to use additional observational data sets to quantify the rate at which the tropics have, have been widening. And it's generally thought that it's, it's probably on, on the lower side of that range, so something more like uh, two degrees. In a recent publication that I was just looking at was quoting a rate of tropical widening of about 0.5 degrees latitude per decade since 1979. Um, so again, that's, that's about two degrees total widening. Uh, that's about uh, 140 miles maybe of widening since 1979 at the low end. Yeah, and, and the implications of tropical widening, from my perspective, the main implication is basically a an expansion of the um, subtropical dry zone. This is kind of the uh, the place on the planet where we have most of the world's deserts, and it's due to kind of the, the subsiding branch of the Hadley circulations um, in both hemispheres. And as we continue to warm the planet and the boundaries of the tropical edge moves further poleward, you can think of that as a of an expansion of these subtropical dry zones. That's probably the biggest implication in terms of an impact on, on humans and, and, and the ecosystem. Now, on your webpage, a description of your research introduces another unsettling complexity to this already tough problem of aerosols. You talk about a process where aerosols have an indirect effect of reducing cloud formation. Could you explain that for us? Yeah, just to back up a second, you know, this is, this is why quantification of the radiative impacts of aerosols is so difficult and why the uncertainty is so large. They, they generally have three different impacts. Um, they have what we call these direct effects, which I've been previously describing as the scattering and absorption of, of solar radiation. Aerosol particles also serve as cloud condensation nuclei, so they have indirect impacts on clouds through changes in cloud microphysics. It's thought that uh, an increase in aerosol particles makes clouds brighter, enhancing the albedo of our planet. They probably also lead to a suppression of precipitation, but it depends on the type of cloud. Um, if you're looking at convective cloud, these aerosol microphysical effects may actually invigorate convection. And then there's an additional way in which aerosols can impact the climate system are these semi-direct effects, whereby an absorbing aerosol, like this black carbon aerosol, heats the atmospheric column, which results in a reduction in the relative humidity and decreases the, uh, the cloud cover. But it turns out that there are multiple semi-direct effects that are dependent on kind of the co-location of the black carbon and the cloud. So this, this cloud desiccation effect that I was just referring to is kind of a, the situation where the black carbon and the cloud are, are co-located. But if it, black carbon is actually, say, above uh, like a low-lying cloud, like a marine stratocumulus, then that actually could result in the opposite effect where you have an increase in cloud cover. This is, this is why reducing the uncertainty in aerosol effects on the climate system is difficult and why the uncertainty kind of remains relatively large today. Yeah, we talked to another atmospheric scientist, Tim Garrett, who said clouds are really almost the, the frontier of science still. It's so hard to nail down how mists and smoke and invisible particles move around, especially in an uncertain future with climate change. There must be a lot of known unknowns, and, and do you expect surprises still to come? Possibly. I mean, I guess in terms of the main areas of, of uncertainty when it comes to um, understanding the aerosol impacts on the climate system generally have to do with their impacts on clouds. Most of the uncertainty in aerosol impacts on the climate system are directly related to their impacts on cloud microphysics. Another significant source of uncertainty um, has to do with the, with the vertical profile of these aerosols, particularly the absorbing aerosols. Because like I mentioned before, if you're interested in trying to understand these, these semi-direct effects, the vertical co-location of the absorbing aerosol relative to the cloud is important. 
But if we don't know where the black carbon is in a vertical atmospheric column, then that makes it difficult to quantify this effect. And a lot of these uncertainties have to do with the fact that it's very difficult to observe clouds and aerosols out in the real world. And when it comes to something like a, like a satellite, for example, the main quantity um, that we observe through satellites is something called the aerosol optical depth. And that is basically just a vertically integrated quantity that tells you something about the amount of sunlight that the aerosol is scattering or, or absorbing. So it doesn't really tell us anything about the type of aerosol or where the aerosol is located vertically and where that aerosol is located relative to the clouds. So there's a lot of uncertainties. Uh, I think a lot of these uncertainties can be reduced by improved observational measurements and probably some finer scale type modeling where we incorporate more of these microphysical effects, like a cloud resolving model, for example. Bob Allen, are you personally worried about climate change? Do you think we're going to see some serious times in the future because we're not acting in time? Uh, I am concerned about climate change on, on many levels. I think that some of the more negative impacts, for example, sea level rise, changes in, in, in vector-borne diseases like malaria and dengue, we had like a Zika outbreak that I'd never heard of two years ago that actually impacted places in, in the United States, like Miami, for example, possible, you know, international conflict, environmental refugees, more extreme weather events like, like hurricanes, for example. These are all very scary. And, you know, even, even the United States, you know, I'm, I, I live in, in, in Southern California in California, and, you know, we've had some pretty big natural disasters over the last couple of years. We had a massive wildfire a few months ago, Paradise, California. It's the largest uh, wildfire in California's history. These are all concerns. They're very significant concerns. And, and, you know, we're going down a path that I don't want to continue going down. Um, unfortunately, the United States is kind of dragging its feet right now. So, Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time, but I know that the science that you're doing will help us at least picture what we're dealing with, and maybe that will be a first step towards some sort of solution. We've been speaking with Dr. Robert Allen, climatologist and associate professor at UC Riverside. We've been talking about the paper Enhanced Land-Sea Warming Contrast Elevates Aerosol Pollution in a Warmer World, published in Nature Climate Change. I will put links to all the science we've talked about in my weekly show blog, published Wednesdays at ecoshock.org. Bob, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.